work. Today we're going to talk about uh, something I did while I was at uh, Eventbrite. Uh, this title of this talk is Search Logs Plus Machine Learning Equals Automatic Tagging. So before we get into this, I'd like to introduce myself. Hi, I'm John Berryman. Uh, recently got a, got a haircut, so that's kind of changed things. Uh, I, I started out in aerospace engineering. Um, I, I moved from aerospace engineering. I, 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 find out, uh, I found out that what I really enjoyed was software and was math. And when all the other people in my office were like, go out and like stare at planes and say, oh, that's the X day, blah, 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 blah. And I think it's got wings, man. I knew it was kind of time to move on. And, uh, and my uh, moving on was into search technology. Uh, along the way, I ended up writing a book. That's not something I would highly recommend, but hey, uh, it can be done. Um, and until recently, I was a discovery engineer at uh, Eventbrite, working on uh, their search and recommendations and stuff. Uh, and just real recently, uh, three weeks ago, I went to went to GitHub. So this is it's it's been a a blast. Um, please follow me on on the Twitters. Uh, I'm going to be posting the slides and stuff later. So that is my name with all the unnecessary characters removed, uh, and you can get the links to the slide after after this. All right, so we're, we're talking about tagging, um, but before we get into it, I, I need to kind of give you a background. What is what is tagging and, and why should you care at all about it? Uh, in order to give you a good introduction to what that is, let, let's back up even one step further. Uh, I am a search engineer. Uh, I am a relevance engineer. Uh, and so the, the way I got started is in e-commerce search. Uh, search, as you probably are well aware, is ubiquitous. Uh, it is the backbone to our access to the internet. Before Google and, you know, Google and friends, uh, we had like directories to help us find something on the internet and they were horrible. You couldn't ever find what you actually wanted to find. Uh, so Google makes the internet possible in a lot of ways. Uh, search is also the backbone to a, a lot of the applications that we use uh, and are very familiar with. Uh, so this is Airbnb, this is Expedia. Uh, there's tons and tons of stuff where the main application you're interfacing is actually search. Um, and also search, even if it's not the main uh, bread and butter, it is embedded in the product. So Facebook, you, you search in 15 different places. Uh, Twitter, there's several search searches, they're all terrible. Uh, Instagram also has search. Now, e-commerce is where search is right in your face because you know you're using a search engine then. So this is Zappos and this is Amazon. And an important part of a search application, obviously, you know, you do all the typical things. You type in the words at the, the top and you've got uh, kind of like this, this, I can walk around with this. Uh, you've got the, kind of the, the breadcrumb thing right here that says I've been looking, I'm in books, I'm in like fiction. Um, you got the results, but on the side, notice these right here. Uh, these are typically called facets. Faceted search is, it allows you to just slice and dice the data set. Uh, but what are you slicing and dicing the data set into? Uh, in terms of like Zappos, you've got like, you know, what clothing type, what sizes, what prices. These are all tags. They're little tidbits of metadata that you're attaching to the products so that you can do interesting things with it. You understand the inventory. You know how uh, the inventory breaks up and you allow your users to also understand the inventory. Now, Recently, a big change is underway uh, that, you know, everything I've showed you to this point has been the same way for the past 15 years. But uh, the move towards mobile is changing the way that people interact with applications. Um, and the reason that it's changing is, like, your thumbs can only do so many, like, characters per second. People like interfaces that are just point, click, well, touch, tap, click. Uh, and, and they don't they don't like really typey stuff. So the idea of this faceted navigation is becoming a lot more dominant in the way that people are interacting with search applications. So when I say what is tagging, now you know, it is the ability to categorize and better understand our inventory so that we can know more about it, uh, the the enterprise itself, and so that our users can interface more easily with it. And why do you want it? because it powers the, the emerging dominant interaction for like e-commerce search and stuff like that. So this is where Eventbrite was, um, you know, and still is, honestly. Uh, so for the past several years, we have a, a categorization system, but it, 
you know, organizers don't really use it. The users uh, need categories, but they don't really have uh, access to it. So we're looking at ways to, to create tagging for Eventbrite. So there's several ways that you can get into it. Um, the most front of mind for us was like, well, maybe we can use curators to tag stuff. Just get an army of people uh, that, that are trained to do this. And it does come with some benefits. Like for one thing, the, the, the curators can be trained to know exactly what your taxonomy is. It's a very, very consistent way of getting this information through. Uh, but the drawback is you're gonna have to train an army of these folks. They're in, in a lot of application spaces, they're not like your you know, fly-by-night users. They're, they're like PhDs and stuff like that in, in some domains. So it's very, very, very expensive to get uh, curation, uh, tagging based on curation. <clears throat> the next option that you might think about is, well, we've got the people creating the content. Let's get them to tag the content. Uh, the benefit is, is that who knows the content better than the people that are generating the content? Uh, and, and you do see a lot of places that actually use this curator-based content, where, like, uh, for in, for instance, like uh, Lowe's, Home Depot, places like that, they have their suppliers who are incentivized to sell their stuff by by making sure it appears on the website correctly. They'll they'll use their taxonomy and enter their stuff into the system. But the drawback for a lot of applications is if your users do not understand why they would use these tags, then you know what's to make them do it. They just they just won't do it. So. You, no good. So, okay, so uh, strike two, let's try three. Uh, maybe we can encourage our customers themselves to tag content. After all, if they're buying the product, then they are the ones that should have the, the last say in like, you know, what this is. They know the space better than su the suppliers even because they are buying stuff. Uh, so that's the benefit. They, the, you know, the, the buck stops at them, buck starts at them quite literally. Uh, but the drawback is that it's, it's even less likely to get a customer to, to tag stuff. We thought about this at Eventbrite too. Maybe there's like a play on like human narcissism. You can say like, look at all the cool things that I know about happening in town right now. Here's all the cool events that you could go to. Um, but it's, it's really hard to get the, 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 the consumers uh, in a, into a kind of a mood to tag stuff. So it kind of begs the question, what do you do if no one is going to tag your stuff and you still need tags? This is very much where Eventbrite is. So about a year ago, uh, the fellow beside me, who is a real data scientist, was working on uh, an interesting uh, problem with, with tags, uh, with, with uh, search, not ta with tags. Uh, he was trying to find the most common searches uh, as people are typing and stuff to, to, to do. Uh, and he's looking for trends. So maybe if we could figure out, you know, this particular search term is, you know, exponentially increasing right now, we need to start figuring out what's going on so we can advertise it. So he was looking into that, uh, and I made some interesting observations. For one, a little background information, every day millions of people ask Eventbrite, you know, what they should do this weekend. They, they look for stuff. Um, over the span of about a month, uh, those users issue approximately 500,000 unique queries. So millions and millions of queries, but 500,000 unique queries. And the most common 1,000 queries uh, accounts for about 41% of all search traffic. So a very, very small number accounts for, you know, most of what's going on uh, on our platform. And the coolest thing, the gotcha moment, uh, is when I realized if you look at the top 1,000 queries, these things look just like tags. Uh, business, kids, networking, Christian, free, 5K run, back to school, they all look like what we wish the organizers were tagging their content with. We, this is what we would, we would pay money for content curator to tag us with, and our users are just like spraying this information at us all the time. So the question, can we use these logged in searches as a training set to build a tagging model? And I sure don't hope so, because this, this talk is called Search Logs and Machine Learning and all that thing. <laughs> all right. So here we go. We're, we're going to take a stab at it. Uh, the initial approach assumes these givens. Uh, first of all, we have search logs. Uh, this is a list of every interaction that a user has had with our interface, where they're typing in you know, what they want to do this weekend. We also have click logs. So if they've searched something, then 
and then they later click on something, we know what they clicked on, and we can link those two together. And finally, whenever they click on something, we are an event site, so we better darn well have you know the description names and all the all the metadata for the event. So given those three tables, then let's make a training set. Step one: find the most common 500 queries. I've, I've kind of scoped it down a little bit to make this. Uh, uh, computationally tractable. So find the most common 500 queries. Of those really popular queries, find every event that was clicked on. And of every event that was clicked on, get the name and description uh, and whatever other information potentially that we th think we need based on that. Okay. So based on that, poof, there's our training set. The X, the input, is the title and body, the name description of, of these events. And the output is the searches that led to those events. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, so, given that, uh, maybe it's as simple as training a model to take X and predict Y. Um, so this is the this is the cool part. Side story. Uh, so I worked for Eventbrite in, until uh, a month ago, and then and I gave this talk with all the data, and then about two days ago, I, I woke up, got out of bed, was like, do I still have that data? I don't work at Eventbrite anymore. The answer was no, but fortunately, uh, past John was pretty pretty smart, and I have like uh, I did store like the output of these things in a, a gist on uh, GitHub. <laughs> so, whoo! Otherwise, I'd have been doing a different song and dance right now. Um, all right, all right, all right. So uh, we got three three of these things to go to. The first one is, is where I'm building all building up this basic model for tagging, uh, and I'm getting ready to show you how well a very simple model works, uh, and then I'm will, I will show you a couple different pain points, and then we'll, we'll improve it. So that's what the, these two guys are for, improvements in, in this initial model. Pause for hydration. Sponsored by Catherine Devlin. Thank you. Um, okay, so get the data. So uh, find the most 500 most common queries, get all the crest. This is basically just what I told you. <clears throat> Once I get that data, the training set looks like this. Uh, we have the event ID, which is inconsequential, really. Uh, we have a bunch of queries, and then we have uh, the title in the body of one event that was led to by, the, by this one. So this is basically a training sample. Blockchain, led, a query for blockchain led to a click by blockchains, blah, blah, blah. Uh, some things have more than one click. So wine tasting events, there's you know two related queries, common delimited, that led to this. Um, I, I did used to just run this like live, uh, and I didn't have like em embarrassing stuff in here. Like uh, I think I've got some like really inappropriate things. So if you see anything awful, avert your eyes. Uh, okay, but anyway, but the, the basic idea is we have, you know, uh, search and uh, exemplar name and description. All right, so given that training set, this is that was the raw data. Now we're going to convert it into uh, the data that we're going to use to train the models. Uh, do pretty simp simple stuff. You're going to see that this, uh, how many people here use IPython notebook, Jupyter, right? How many people use pandas? How many pe people use scikit-learn for stuff? OK. So uh, for a lot of you, a lot of this stuff is going to be pretty, f pretty familiar. And even if it's not, it's not that hard. Um, so first things first is we take the data that we got uh, split up into titles, bodies, and uh, what's the plural of tags? Tags is, uh, but that's that's my <laughs> helps me remember. Um, so really simple application here. Basically, you take the body, strip out the h uh, the XML, HTML. Um, we're going to split this into uh, tagging, uh, sorry, training and uh, testing sets. So. We have appropriately lame versions of each of these fields. Uh, in both cases, we're going to take, <coughs> well, in the case of the training, rather, we're going we're gonna to create the scikit-learn pipeline. Uh, all a pipeline is is a set of steps about how to process information. So this pipeline for the title is you take a count vectorizer, um, pull out stop words like v and but, you just throw those away, uh, keep only the the stuff where it's relatively common, the document frequency occurs more than 19 times, and, and then you do a TF-IDF transformation. Uh, and term frequency, inverse document frequency, that's what 
that little tidbit there there means uh, basically means for if you have a document and the word occurs more often, it must be more important. If you have a doc, uh, if you have a word that occurs across a lot of the documents, then it, that word, like the word the, must not be that important. So after these two steps, count vectorization and TF-IDF transformation, we've taken what was originally a paragraph, or this this is a title, you know, it's a set of about you know five words, something like that, and we've turned it into a vector of uh, of like I think it's like fourteen thousand, where it's like the first column is like did the word banana happen? No. Did the word uh, dance happen? Yes. Did the word blah, blah, blah. And you got uh, a bunch of ones and zeros for how many times these things occurred. And then TFIDF basically says uh, how important is the word. So you've got a, a big long vector of every word in English potentially. And um, the the higher the value is, the more important that word was. Okay, so uh, let's, in order, in order to make it more concrete, I'll, I'll just show you what it looks like. Uh, so after having done this to the title and description, uh, we now have what used to be that that uh, set of rows at the top has now become a matrix. Uh, there is 14,000 rows in the matrix and 13,000 uh, some odd uh, columns in the matrix. The columns cor corresponds to words um, that, that we just happen to run across. And just to give you an, an example, in a typical description, I think this is a description vector, uh, almost all of the uh, items in that row for that event are zero. And the non-zero items, it kind of range from zero to, to you know, 0.5 or something like that. So th that gives you an idea of what they look like. All right, so now we've got the title and description. Uh, they were words where humans can read them, but now they're numbers where computers are really comfortable with them. And we're going to do something very similar for the targets. So the target values were like uh, a person searched for dance class or something like that. Uh, we need to turn that into something that a computer is comfortable with. So uh, we're going to apply a count vectorizer. We're just not going to apply the TF-IDF bit to it. And the end result is something like this. Um, we have, again, you know, there's uh, 14,422 items in our training set. But this time, this matrix only has uh, 449 uh, items wide because effectively I was looking at, uh, I lied, uh, instead of the top 500 queries, I was looking for whatever reason at the top 449 queries. So in this particular, I, I pulled out one example. This particular row uh, was um, looked at based on two different searches. And so the, the non-zero elements there is one, one. Okay, so input is a big, long vector, mostly zeros, and then some, like, uh, floating point numbers. The output we're trying to find is a much shorter vector, 500-ish, uh, and mostly zeros and sometimes ones, right? And we're trying to take this and predict that. Now, if we can make a computer figure out that connection, then we can do the same type thing and take this vector and turn it back into, like, you know, what search this looks like. So we've got uh, everything that we'll need to make an actual tagging system. Did the mechanics make sense? That would be a decent place for a, a pause if you guys had any questions about it. Shoot. All right. These. These right here. Basically, it's uh, if we have. The quick brown dog is a uh, half of a sentence. Uh, so that, that's a sentence. And if in this representation we have every value in the vector corresponding to the, the quick brown dog is a, a slot for every word that could occur in English. So it's a really long vector, which, you know, the quick brown dog is only three words. So it's all zeros except, you know, row, uh, column 4,321 corresponds to dog, so it says 0.5, something like that. And, and so you've got four non, three non-zeros, that makes sense. And the value, uh, why it's not just one, has to do with how important the word is. So the word the occurs all the time. So if you, if you even kept the at all, then it would have a very low score. And the word dog doesn't occur that often, so it would be like 0.5 or something like that. All right, so effectively we have our training set. 
Now, this is the part where I was hoping to wow and amaze you. I was hoping to wow and amaze myself because I'm dealing with deep learning. And I, I pulled out Keras. Keras is built on top of TensorFlow, which has all the good uh, buzzwords right now. And I, I you know, read, read the manual and, and figured out how to make uh, a multi-layer blah, blah, blah. And I really tried to make something complicated, and I wanted to make it complicated and work awesomely. I wanted it to, like, solve my problem and play chess with me. But I didn't have to, it didn't have to be that complicated. Uh, I ended up doing complicated stuff, and it took forever to, to, uh, to train. And I, I ended up just start ripping stuff out, and I got to a um, two, is this, like, two hidden layers right here? And it's basically, it's a matrix multiplication uh, to take this input vector to something and another matrix, matrix multiplication with nonlinearities in, in the middle. And lo and behold, it worked pretty well. So you could take this input blah vector, predict the output blah vector, and then in order to make it back human readable again, you say, okay, well, it's the d decoder key. If, if I have a one in the 430 second slot, then it's a, you know, dance class. All right, so let's see how it works. Um, garbage code that helps me print out stuff. Uh, so in the examples here, uh, we have what our little algorithm predicted. Uh, we have the truth. We actually saw an in indication that someone uh, queried this, and then we have a little sample of the original text. Uh, mostly good, some weird though. So mostly good, uh, this predicted beauty, truth was beauty, and the, the event was around the world, beauty, beauty, da, da, da. yeah, nailed it, right? Um, this is interesting because it predicted a lot of different stuff, art, business, meditation, mindfulness, whereas the truth is someone's uh, searched leadership seminar. But actually, it works out all right, the art of mindful leadership. So we predicted a lot of stuff that wasn't in the, you know, wasn't actually even the training set. Uh, or this, uh, by the way, this is the test set. I had the training set and the test set. So this is on site unseen data. But it predicts it, predicted something that was far different from what truth was. But by God, they kind of got it right. I mean, these, these are the right things to be saying. Um, this is a weird one until you know uh, about Eventbrite, but a lot of people host their bridal shows on Eventbrite, and a lot of vendors say, I want to work at that, and they're looking for jobs. And so this is just how they're looking for vendors needed in the text of the events right there. Um, okay, so anyways, uh, back to our presentation. All right, so very, very, very hopeful initial results. There are some potential problems, though. Um, so one thing that, um, it, that we would see if we kept looking through examples, <coughs> this data set was taken uh, around Memorial Day last year. And so what you see in the, in the training set is like the most common query, um, among the most common queries, Memorial Day was definitely one of them. Memorial Day weekend events, even though it means about the same thing, was also super common. Uh, Memorial Day weekend was also super common. And it's effectively, you're taking up three slots on our limited vocabulary for what is effectively the same word. Uh, so this, this is very unfortunate. It means you're tagging stuff superfluously. Uh, if you have an event on the website that's tagged by the same thing three times, it's going to lower, lower trust in the application. Um, our, ta our tagging vocabulary doesn't have the breadth that it should have. It, it only describes a, a limited set of stuff because it's being so redundant. Um, and then a little bit different problem is a lot of the, the and this, this problem is, is one that actually by the end we're not really going to solve, but um, we, a lot of the tags for events, it only has one or two tags. It'd be nice to have a big bunch of tags for, for every event like hierarchical even. This is dance, this is merengue, stuff like that. All right, so let's get a little bit better. In the improved version, uh, there's a few different things that we can do. Uh, so one thing that you might notice is, is that when users are using our search, they're not just typing a search, being satisfied, and leaving. I wish that was the case. But a lot of times, it's, it's a conversation back and forth between our customers. They type in a search. They look at the results. They think, ah, it's not understanding my query, or I meant this other thing. And they'll revise their search and look for something similar. And we'll see really neat examples of this in a second. Um, but they're doing spelling correction, where they, they realize they made a mistake. 
they're doing word synonyms where it's like, you know, that didn't quite find what I want, but maybe, you know, the event used a different word, so I'll just try something else. And they're doing just general uh, refinements, clarifications on their own queries. So the, the idea, the thing that maybe we can use to improve a lot of the problems on the last slide, is we can look at how these queries in a single user's search session, uh, how they work together. Uh, and if we can start seeing patterns, then we can start grouping together synonyms and stuff like that. And we can train a neural network not on the individual queries, but on the family of related queries. It's like we start grouping, and that's the level before we get to the, the training. All right, so that takes me to notebook number two. By the way, is that big enough? That's plenty big enough, isn't it? All right, so uh, this one has a different starting point. In this one, we're looking at, given a user session, you search for dance, then you thought, no, I want dance class, and then I want merengue. We're looking at all those words, all those searches that happened with one user's uh, session. And so, for example, um, these are a lot of these are kind of redundant. So, like, here, here's the problem I had earlier. Memorial Day weekend, and then someone's like, no, no, no. I'm on an event's website, and I want you to really understand I'm looking for a Memorial Day weekend event. Uh, they might type that, apparently, and that was our most common one, by the way. Uh, but then you get stuff that, that makes a little bit more sense. Uh, probably my, my favorite one on this particular list is uh, job fair and career fair. So I didn't find quite what I want, but I want to find the you know a synonym for it, just in case the event used a different word. Um, and this number right here associated with these, uh, we call it edge weight, but basically it's a count. It's the number of times that someone typed this and then later typed that. So that's what that is. So we're going to start using that to create uh, a network of how these different queries are related. Now, in principle, we could have our graph of like, you know, we put a, a dot on the board and write Memorial Day weekend by it, another dot or, and write blah, blah, blah events by it, and, you know, connect them and say this edge weight is, you know, 5,000 points. Uh, but you run into kind of a problem where you have some queries like Memorial Day weekend that were just so super popular that they seem like they're related to everything. So you need, you need kind of a way of uh, normalizing that and saying, okay, well, this is just a noisy one. Everyone loves the Beatles. We're not going to recommend you the Beatles for every song in, in Spotify. Um, so the way we did this is basically you say, okay, uh, Memorial Day weekend events occurred this many times with the more Memorial Day weekend events, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but there's 10 rows that has this for no day. That's what this means. So we're going to just do it kind of a, an extra st step, count those up, and we're going to divide this column by this column, and we're going to get something that says, okay, well, this, if this one was a noisy one, because like Memorial Day weekend, Memorial Day events was, occurred so many times, then at least we, but by dividing by this, then this normalized edge weight kind of like dampens out some of that effect. Does that make sense? All right, so given that, we're going to create an adjacency matrix, uh, which on the columns is every query. On the rows, it's every query. And the values in this matrix is basically uh, how strongly related these are. So uh, mother is highly associated. Let's see, mother and mother. Uh, all the mother things are highly associated together. So mother, uh, I, I've got zeros for, you know, directly associated with itself, because that didn't appear. But mother is closely associated with Mother's Day. but uh, closely associated with Mother's Day brunch, but like uh, Memorial Day weekend was absolutely not associated with Mother's Day brunch, stuff like that. So you, you get kind of a natural clumping of data, which is exactly what we want. All right, so now we're going to use this thing that's kind of magic. It's nice. Scikit-learn uh, used to kind of apply the, uh, uh, the, the data science thing. Uh, it's called affinity propagation, and uh, it, it is a way of clumping this stuff together for us. And we see, I'll skip ahead just a little bit, and we see that, uh, oh yeah, okay, so this is a big mistake on my part. When I save this notebook, I'm just doing taking a random sample, and whatever I saved it on is not partic particularly the, the best stuff. So you got Fashion Week and Leagues of Legend and LOL. So that's garbage. Sorry about that. But you do have stuff that kind of makes sense. Um, you've got... Uh, Oak Room and Oak Room, so that's a, a spelling correction type thing. People, you know, thought, you know, maybe I should do that. Couples, date, night, marriage. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, people looking for, to help out in events. Hospitality Hotel. 
And so it's actually doing the right thing to, to, to chop this stuff together. And <laughs> this is great. 15 different terms that are associated with all the buzzword. This is like the buzzword chunk right here. Um, but for each of these, we have, uh, we have whatever is closely associated, and we have um, the exemplar for the field. So of all this, the buzzwords one, including misspellings and, you know, just closely related stuff, uh, we said, okay, lump them all together and just call them all blockchain. Cool. So now we have our clustering algorithm. So now we have a good starting point of taking uh, a much larger set and, and chunking it into something smaller. Uh, the last step we're going to do is kind of an ingredient data set for the next slide, uh, the next notebook. But I'm going to take all that data, and originally I had that uh, the the rows by columns matrix of all the queries and how they're related to all the other queries. Effectively, I'm just going to zero out all the rows that were not in the the exemplar set. So we have you know uh, how important is Bitcoin? Well, we don't know. We don't care. But blockchain, it actually gets it gets all the points. So uh, effectively, I'm going to have a a matrix which is now the columns correspond to every query we've ever seen. The rows with all the uh, not a numbers washed away correspond to a much smaller set. These are like the exemplars. These are the cluster uh, leaders. All right. This gives us a way of mapping down from every query I've ever seen to a much smaller set. Let us do so. All right. So at this point, we are back at the beginning. I am going to go and get a data set uh, that is, here's all the queries that have happened, uh, one query at a time. Here is an exemplar event that was clicked on from Ozio, whatever that is, uh, name description. Uh, I'm keeping track of just a little bit more information this time. I'm keeping track of the count lists. So this query led to this event four times. This query led to this event three times. Gotcha. Um, but, uh, oh yeah, gosh, I apologize. <laughs> We, we have those. Um, don't look. So once we have this little bit richer data set, we have uh, effectively we're going to do exactly what we did. Oh, wait, wait. Let me think, let me think, let me think. Here's this upset. Oh, uh, I'm, I'm double checking. This is something that effectively I'll probably skip over. But I'm double checking that when I collapse these terms together that they, that they make sense. Um, Effectively, I'm going to get, uh, at the end of the day, I'm going to use uh, matrix multiplication. Have you guys ever seen that symbol right there? Python 3, NumPy, it's matrix multiplication, which is really a cool way to overload that uh, operator. Uh, but you can take what, uh, what normally would be like uh, a double nested layer of for loops to, to get the, the best word based on all the, the queries that are... All that stuff, you don't have to worry about it. You can effectively do a matrix multiplication and get, uh, given given a query that you, the queries that you've seen for this event, what is the best query? What's the exemplar query for, for that? Uh, and now we have a new training set. Um, that looks like, oh, I washed it all the way. That looks, it looks like the thing at the top, but it's basically instead of like, you know, any query term, it is like one of our better query terms, our chosen elect few query terms, and then the name of an event and the description of an event. Given that refined data set, uh, we do the same processing. Uh, I've compacted a little bit, but we have count T TFID effectorizers. Um, we turn them into the, the same exact stuff we saw earlier. The only thing that's a little bit different is uh, this... Uh, the training set, instead of being a vector of zeros or ones, for one meaning this event was searched with this query, uh, I've got floating point numbers there now because I know how strong that query was uh, based on the number of times and based upon how, you know, how these words kind of like added up you know, to, to the, the more important term. All right, so model building, same exact shape as before. Uh, this takes about uh, 10 minutes to run. Uh, it's, it's the simplest model that you can imagine. And the results, drum roll please, uh, look like this. Um, so the I've got this in a little bit different order for some reason, but 
the an event titled uh, Foster Love 5K 10K Boston. Uh, someone queried 5K, but it was predicted to be uh, 5K. So perfect. Uh, this one is a really interesting one. Uh, someone had queried wine, and my gosh, we look at all these different uh, tags that were predicted from it: Afro Caribbean Day Party, Memorial Day Weekend events, Reggae. Uh, is that two different spellings? Oh, Reggae and Reggae Fest, wine, wine tasting events. Uh, so that's where I start to think, man, this the tagging algorithm is a little bit over overreactive, right? But actually, if you look at it, Afro Caribbean Wine Fest, it has everything that makes sense for this. So it's a really interesting problem. We've actually in potentially when you're trying to evaluate how well we've done. Uh, it, it's nice to look at accuracy. It's like this thing has predicted the uh, the original term this many times. The original term, is, these are these are accurate, even though it's predicting a lot more than the original term was. So it might not look like we've got great accuracy, but by a human looking at it, it might actually be better than the data set that was used to build it. Um, obviously, that's not always the case, though. Foam, foam, foam party, yay. Uh, open mic. Um, marketing got tagged as Memorial Day weekend events and startup probably a little bit off. I suspect it was on like Memorial uh, Day, and it had stuff that was related to like uh, like startups, uh, customers using pay tactics, blah blah blah. So might be something. Uh, fashion got tagged as fashion show. Blockchain got tagged as blockchain pitch startup, but it but it is all these things, so it's doing a pretty good job. Um. And there you go. Um, so that's about it for the models. We have five minutes left. All right, so wrapping up then, there's a few things to notice. Um, one thing is, is that we've done a pretty good job with the fewer synonyms. So blockchain and Bitcoin and blockchain misspellings, they all get mapped down to one word. So that has a lot higher quality tag. Uh, you're not going to tag things with misspellings, for example, nearly as often. Um, also, we've we've got a lot more data. So in the previous one, since we had to keep the vocabulary fairly narrow, 500 terms tops, this time we've said, okay, well, give us 2,000 terms, and we're going to collapse them to 500 terms to make it the same difficulty building the model. But all the events clicked on from the first 2,000 most popular terms that accounts for 52% uh, of our traffic as compared to like 33%. So a lot better data to model from. And since we're, we're squishing out all of these common terms, uh, we have a lot broader vocabulary. We're not using you know three slots for variants of Memorial Day. There are some drawbacks, though, that are interesting uh, and are introduced by the, the intermediate grouping process. Uh, for one thing, uh, we, we start pulling together words that are only loosely related. Uh, the buzzword uh, block that I showed you earlier uh, links together AI and blockchain. And ostensibly, these things these things aren't exact synonyms for sure. They just happen to occur in a lot of the same buzzy type events. Uh, something that's less less obvious is if the slides will go away. <laughs> Ozio Rosebar is like, well, what's that, and why why are those associated? This is uh, this is something where Algorithms can kind of screw with your business if you're not really careful. That's why you still need a little bit of curation for stuff like this. I, after some research, Ozio is a bar in Washington, D.C. And if you're looking for something to do at Ozio this night and uh, you, you don't find anything, then a really good place to go to is Rose Bar, which is like next door and their competitors. So that's something you don't want your own event tagged with your competitor's name. Uh, it's an interesting side effect of, of data science there. Uh, tagging rela related applications. So th there's a lot of neat stuff that we can do with this, uh, and we, we've been trying experiments with this at Eventbrite. But given a better, more rich set of tags for each events, then you can you can create new UI interfaces that allow people to slice and dice through it. Uh, you can un identify kind of relationships among the tags. So as people are slicing and dicing, you know kind of how to direct them to what they're thinking about. Uh, as organizers are creating their events. It's nice to tell them, hey, would you like to tag your event with something that people are actually going to be searching for? So you can help organizers out with that. Uh, and it also, we had a lot of interest from back office people who are like, you know, we've got this inventory 
and we have no idea like who is buying what or what like categories, what buckets these things naturally fall in. And so these type algorithms should be very useful for actually helping out, uh, helping the business understand uh, stuff all the more. Uh, future work, if I was still at Eventbrite, uh, better better coverage. Uh, we've we've done a pretty good job of, about getting fifty percent of the traffic taken care of, but Remember, you know, 2,000 queries covers 50% of search interactions, but then there's another 498,000 that, that account for the rest of them. So how do you get, like, in that longer tail distribution? That's going to be really hard. Um, there are also just issues like model, models biased towards, like, really, really common uh, things. Uh, day party popped up a lot. Um, and then there's just other just kind of practical stuff. Eventbrite is doing what a lot of companies are doing right now and trying to figure out how to make data science and data engineering play nicely together. So just getting stuff shipped out is, is uh, an interesting challenge. Uh, questions in a bit. Uh, since I have the bully pul pulpit, I'll, I'll just su su summarize some final notes. Uh, follow, follow me on Twitter. That is, that's my Twitter. If you do, you get access to these slides, which I will post as soon as I sit down. Uh, and there's links to everything uh, right there. Um, there's also s some organizations I'm, I'm associated with. Uh, data nerds, uh, if you're like an aspiring data scientist, uh, check out that event. A lot of that is in Nashville, so check us out if you're in Nashville. But a little bit more general and something that you guys might be interested in is if you are a learner and you like just learning new things, and if you're a social learner, you like learning with people, uh, I've, I've pitched this at Pi Ohio about every time I've been here, but uh, Penny University is a peer-to-peer -peer organization where you get to uh, sit down with others, buy them coffee, grab a Google Hangout now, uh, and it's basically a way of interacting with people and saying, hey, community, I want to learn a little bit more about Bayesian inference, or I want to learn a little bit more about CSS or anything, and then someone from, from the community will say, well, that's cool. Uh, you know, give me about 15 minutes, give me an hour, and then we'll, I'll help you. Uh, with whatever you want to do. So that's pinnyuniversity.org, no spaces. And that's it. And I have two minutes, so I have one question ready to go. <laughs> I shouldn't say it so imitating last. It is a Google group. It's the most horrible interface ever. We're, we're working on that. <laughs> All right. Uh, going once. Thank you guys very much. Thank you for being here.